Chapter 2, Female Sexual Anatomy and Physiology. All genitalia are not created equal. So over the next two chapters, we're going to be talking about female sexual anatomy and male sexual anatomy. There is a wide variation in appearance in both male and female genitalia. While males, along with their genitalia, have been exalted, the less visible female genitalia has been seen as inferior. The exterior female sex organs are known as the vulva. Pudendum, another word for vulva, derives from the Latin pudendus, meaning something to be ashamed of. The mons veneris is the fatty tissue that covers, cushions, and protects the joint of the pubic bones in front of the body. At puberty, it becomes covered with pubic hair, which traps the chemical secretions that emanate from the vagina. The labia majora are the large folds of skin along the sides of the vulva. Well supplied with nerve endings, they respond to stimulation as well as protect the inner genitalia. Labia minora are hairless membranes that surround the urethral and vaginal openings located between the labia majora. The inner labia are highly sensitive to sexual stimulation. The clitoris or clitoris is the only part of the human body whose sole function is pleasure. Similar to the penis, the clitoris consists of erectile tissue. The clitoris is well supplied with nerve endings and is the sexual organ most sensitive to sexual sensation. Both the clitoris and the penis develop from the same embryonic tissue. While both organs receive and transmit sexual sensations, the penis is also directly involved in reproduction and excretion. Female genital mutilation is still practiced in many countries worldwide and leaves both physical and emotional scars. The vestibule is the openings to the vagina and the urethra. The urethral opening is located above the vaginal opening. Urine passes from the body through the urethral opening. And the proximity of the urethral opening to the vaginal opening, as well as the shorter length of the urethral in women, increases a woman's chance of contracting a urinary tract infection, such as cystitis. Cystitis can be prevented by drinking lots of fluids, including orange or cranberry juice, decreasing the use of alcohol and caffeine, and maintaining the cleanliness around the urethral opening. The vaginal opening, or introitus, lies below and larger than the urethral opening. A fold of tissue called the hymen covers the vaginal opening. This tissue is usually present at birth and remains at least partly intact until a woman engages in coitus. It is not true that one may determine whether or not a woman is a virgin by examination of the hymen. The perineum consists of the skin and underlying tissue between the vaginal opening and the anus. It is well supplied with nerve endings. During pregnancy and subsequently labor and delivery, an episiotomy is the cutting of the perineal tissue during labor. Now the next slide gives you a illustration of the various parts of the female sexual anatomy. You can also find that diagram in your textbook. There are several structures that underlie the external sex organs. The clitoral crura are wing-shaped, leg-like structures that attach the clitoris to the pubic bone beneath. Vestibular bulbs are attached at the top of the clitoris. During sexual arousal, blood fills the bulbs, swelling the vulva and lengthening the vagina. Bartholin's glands secrete a couple of drops of lubrication just before orgasm, but this fluid has no known purpose. The major source of vaginal lubrication comes from the vaginal walls themselves. There are also muscles along the pelvic floor that permit women to constrict the vaginal and anal openings. Again, there is another diagram on the next slide which illustrates the various parts of the underlying sex organs.
The internal sex organs of the female include the innermost parts of the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and two ovaries, each connected to the uterus by a fallopian tube. The vagina is a collapsible muscular tube, usually three to five inches long at rest, that contains the penis during sexual intercourse and through which a baby is born. While the walls of the vagina are well supplied with blood vessels, they are poorly innervated by nerves and therefore fairly insensitive. This also then limits the pain experienced during childbirth. Now the vagina normally has an acidic pH. This pH is necessary to maintain the healthy vaginal flora. Interestingly, the acidity of the vagina kills many of the sperm deposited during sexual intercourse. Vaginitis or vaginal inflammation may be due to a number of causes such as infection, antibiotics, fatigue, or diets that are high in sugars or refined carbohydrates. Abnormal discharge, itching, burning, and urinary urgency characterize vaginitis. The chart on the next slide gives you some helpful tips of how to avoid vaginitis. The cervix is the lower end of the uterus. The opening in the middle of the cervix, known as the os, OS, is normally dilated to about the width of a straw, but during labor it dilates sufficiently to allow the passage of the baby's head. Now, cervical cancer is relatively uncommon in the United States, but there are about 11,000 new cases a year and approximately 4,000 deaths. The primary cause is infection with the human papillomavirus, or HPV, which you can get a vaccination for it. The vaccine has been developed that makes most women immune. The pap test, which you get when you go to visit your gynecologist, examines cervical cells for abnormalities and is recommended for women who are or did for women who are or who have been sexually active or have reached the age of 18. The uterus, also known as the womb, is the hollow, muscular, pear-shaped organ in which a fertilized ovum implants and develops until birth. The uppermost part of the uterus is called the fundus, the central part is called the body, and the lower part is known as the cervix. The uterus has three layers. The protective outermost layer is called the parametrium, while the well-muscled middle layer is the myometrium, and the innermost layer is called the endometrium. The endometrium is richly supplied with blood vessels and glands. During menstruation, the endometrial tissue is shed through the vagina. Now, endometriosis is a condition in which the endometrial tissue grows in the abdominal cavity or elsewhere in the reproductive system rather than staying reproductive system rather than staying in the uterus. Endometrial cancer is cancer of the endometrial lining. There are about 42,000 new cases each year with about 7,700 deaths. Risk factors include high exposure to estrogen from early menarche or early onset of your period, late menopause, or estrogen replacement therapy. The fallopian tubes extend from the upper end of the uterus out toward the ovaries. Now the outer part of the fallopian tube have these fringe-like projections called fembri that extend toward the ovary but actually don't touch the ovary. Now the ovum pass through the fallopian tubes on their way to the uterus. So once they're released from the ovary, they then pass into the fallopian tubes and head towards the uterus. But those fallopian tubes aren't simply, fallopian tubes aren't simply just passageways. They also help to nourish and conduct the ova. So now problems that can arise is when a fertilized egg actually implants outside of the uterus instead of inside the uterus. That most often happens in the fallopian tubes. It is called then an ectopic pregnancy. And ectopic pregnancies can be very dangerous for the mom. There's not enough room for the baby to grow, and so consequently that can lead to hemorrhaging and potentially even death if not taken care of. The ovaries are almond-shaped organs that lie on either side of the uterus. They are directly attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligaments. Now, ovaries produce sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. 
Estrogen actually refers to several female sex hormones that promote the development of female sex characteristics, male sex characteristics, and regulate the menstrual cycle. Progesterone stimulates proliferation of the endometrium in preparation for pregnancy and is also involved in the regulation of the menstrual cycle. At birth, a female, a human female, a little baby girl is born with all of the eggs that she will ever have. Now, these ova are very immature at birth, but once puberty hits, one ova will fully mature and be released each month from puberty until menopause. Ovarian cancer. Each year, some 21,000 women in the United States are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and about 14,000 die from it. It is the fourth leading cancer killer of women. Risk factors include a family history of ovarian cancer, never having given birth, and high body weight. Ovarian cancer often shows no obvious signs or symptoms. The most common sign is enlargement of the most common sign is enlargement of the abdomen due to fluid accumulation. Early detection in the form of a pelvic exam is key. Hysterectomy is the surgical removal of the uterus. One woman in three in the United States has a hysterectomy by the age of 60. Now there's a complete hysterectomy, which is the surgical removal of the ovaries, fallopian tubes, cervix, and uterus, or there's a partial hysterectomy, which is the removal of the uterus, but not the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Pelvic examinations. Your textbook discusses that women are advised to have a pelvic exam at least once a year from late teens onward, or earlier if they become sexually active. Recently, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has come out and recommended screening for cervical cancer between the ages of 21 and 65 every three years. Three years. Now, during a pelvic exam, first, women are examined externally for irritations, swellings, and discharge. Then, insertion of a speculum allows the physician to inspect inside in the cervix and the vaginal walls. There's a diagram on the next slide that demonstrates how this happens. Now, a pap test has performed a test for cervical cancer. During this test, a sample of cells is scraped from the cervix. The physician manually examines the location, shape, size, and movability of the internal sex organs. And then finally, the physician should perform a rectovaginal exam. In some cultures, the breasts are viewed as biological instruments for feeding infants. But a lot of times in the culture of the United States, we have eroticized breasts. Breasts are considered to be Breasts are considered to be secondary sexual characteristics. That is, they distinguish women from men, but are not directly involved in reproduction. Each breast contains milk-producing glands called mammary glands. Now, women vary little in their amount of glandular tissue, which is the fatty tissue between the glands that determines breast size. Now, as far as the anatomy of the breast, you can look on the, the diagram on the next slide. There is a nipple that lies in the center of the areola, the colored ring that surrounds the nipple. So while nursing, milk is released through the nipple. And then oil is produced from glands in the areola to lubricate the nipples during breastfeeding. While breast cancer rates are slowly rising in the U.S., more cases of breast cancer are being detected early due to increased awareness and mammography. Risk factors for breast cancer include advancing age, as well as genetic factors, prolonged exposure to estrogen, and heavy alcohol consumption. For detection and treatment of breast cancer, early detection reduces the risk of mortality. Breast cancer may be detected by breast self-examination or physical examination, but it is best detected by mammography. Treatments for breast cancer include a lumpectomy or even a mastectomy, which removes the entire breast. There's also chemotherapy and radiation as options.
Menstruation is the cyclical bleeding due to the shedding of the inner lining of the uterus. It occurs when a reproductive cycle has not led to fertilization of an ovum. The average cycle is about 28 days, although there can be large variations between women, as well as in the same woman from month to month. Variations in the cycle may be due to physiological causes or even psychological ones. The cycle is divided into four phases. The proliferative phase, ovulation, the luteal phase, and menstruation. For ease of counting, day one is the first day of the menstrual period, although in reality the cycle begins with the end of menstruation and the initiation of a series of events leading to the maturation of the egg. The endocrine system is a series of glands that release hormones into the bloodstream. In addition to being reproductive organs, the ovaries and the uterus are also endocrine organs. Other endocrine organs involved in the regulation of menstruation are the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is a small structure in the front of the brain. It is involved in regulating many states that we need for survival, including hunger, thirst, aggression, and sex. The hypothalamus also regulates secretions from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is also known as the master gland, and it has many secretions that regulate other endocrine glands. Hormones from the pituitary involved in reproduction include prolactin, which stimulates the production of milk, oxytocin, which causes uterine contractions during labor and milk letdown during breastfeeding, Follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, causes the eggs in the form of follicles to mature each menstrual cycle. And then luteinizing hormone, or LH, which causes ovulation. As mentioned earlier, there are four phases of the menstrual cycle. The first phase of the cycle following menstruation is called the proliferative phase, which lasts approximately from 5 to 13 days. During this time, between 10 and 20 ova mature within their follicles and the endometrial lining begins to thicken. This stage is also called the pre-ovulatory or follic follicular phase. At the end of the menstrual period, the levels of estrogen are very low. So the hypothalamus responds to this by secreting GnRH, which stimulates the release of FSH from the anterior pituitary. FSH stimulates ovarian follicles to mature, grow, and start to produce estrogen. One follicle then reaches full maturity and it's ovulated. And this is called the Graafian follicle. This phase is therefore associated with an increasing level of estrogen. And estrogen causes the endometrial to thicken and thins the cervical mucus. Second stage, the ovulatory phase. This occurs approximately the 14th day of the cycle, and that's when the ovary releases a mature ovum. By day 12 of the cycle, the developing follicles are secreting large amounts of estrogen. This surge of estrogen triggers the pituitary to release a large amount of LH, which then triggers ovulation. 12 to 14 hours later, the mature ovum is released near a fallopian tube. If two ova mature and are released during ovulation and both are fertilized, fraternal twins will develop. Identical twins result from the division of a single fertilized ovum. Now, ovulation may not occur in every menstrual cycle. Ano anovulatory cycles are most common in the years just after menarche, just after the start of the menstrual cycle. Now, when the ovum is released, follicular cells are left behind in the ovary. These cells become the corpus luteum. The third phase is the secretory phase, sometimes referred to as the luteal phase. In the ovary, the corpus luteum acts as an endocrine gland and produces large amounts of progesterone and estrogen. Progesterone causes the endometrial to thicken, enabling it to support an embryo in case fertilization occurs. 
This stage is also called the post-ovulatory phase and lasts approximately from day 15 to day 28. So if fertilization does not occur, the hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland to stop producing LH and FSH. The corpus luteum then degenerates and progesterone levels plummet, constricting blood vessels to the endometrium. And this final phase is called menstruation. So the menstrual phase, an end and a beginning. So the menstrual phase or period is the sloughing off of the inner lining of the uterus. Menstruation occurs when estrogen and progesterone levels are too low to sustain the uterine lining, which disintegrates and is discharged from the body. Low estrogen levels then signal the hypothalamus to release GnRH, increasing FSH levels, then resuming the proliferative phase of the cycle. Menstrual flow contains blood and tissue from the endometrium, as well as cervical and vaginal mucus. So sex during menstruation. It's important to note that there's no evidence that sex during menstruation is harmful. Many couples continue to have sex during menstruation. Other couples abstain. Evidence has shown that an orgasm during the menstrual cycle may actually help to relieve a woman's discomfort during her period. Over time, the reproductive capacity of the ovaries slowly declines starting in the mid-30s, a process known as the climacteric period. Perimenopause refers to the beginning of menopause. It's usually characterized by 3 to 11 months of amenorrhea, or irregular periods. Menopause, or the process of the cessation of menstruation, is a particular event in the climacteric process. It most commonly occurs between the ages of 46 and 50 and lasts for about two years. In menopause, the pituitary gland continues to produce normal amounts of FSH and LH, but the ovaries lose their capacity to respond to these hormones. Therefore, eggs no longer ripen and production of estrogen and progesterone cease. So the deficit in estrogen can lead to a number of physical sensations for women during the menopausal time period. They can include dizziness, headaches, joint pain, variations in body temperature, which can cause night sweats, cold sweats, hot flashes, skin can become drier, and there is some loss of breast tissue as well as decreased vaginal lubrication during sexual arousal. As estrogen helps maintain bone density, menopause may be associated with osteoporosis. In addition to a number of physical sensations, estrogen deficiency also has a number of psychological effects, including impairments in cognitive functioning and feelings of psychological well-being. So because of a combination of physical sensations as well as psychological effects, many women turn to hormone replacement therapy as a way of dealing with these symptoms. So is hormone replacement therapy good medicine or is it something that can potentially be harmful? It is controversial. Now there can be problems that happen during the menstrual cycle. Dysmenorrhea is pain or discomfort that happens during menstruation. It is the most common type of menstrual problem. Menstrual pain may include cramps, lower back pain, swelling and tenderness of the breasts, as well as headaches. Menstrual cramps result from uterine spasms caused by the secretion of prostaglandins. Drugs such as ibuprofen or aspirin inhibit prostaglandins and those may help with the symptoms. Fluid also accumulates in the pelvic region and breasts, which leads to pressure and bloating. Headaches may be due to muscle tension or from changes in blood flow in the brain. Now there's primary dysmenorrhea, which is menstrual pain or discomfort that occurs in the absence of known organic problems. Secondary dysmenorrhea is menstrual pain or discomfort that is caused by identified organic problems, such as endometriosis 
or pelvic inflammatory disease, also known as PID. So amenorrhea is the absence of menstruation. Primary amenorrhea occurs if a woman has not yet menstruated by age 16 or 17. Secondary amenorrhea is delayed or absent menstrual periods in women who have had regular periods in the past. This may be due to structural or hormonal abnormalities, stress, or low body weight. Amenorrhea during pregnancy or following menopause is normal. There are two syndromes associated with menstrual problems. The first is premenstrual syndrome, or PMS. PMS is a combination of physical and psychological symptoms, such as anxiety, depression, mood swings, irritability, weight gain, and abdominal discomfort that afflicts nearly three out of four women for four to six days before the menstrual period begins. The other disorder that can arise as a result of a menstrual problem is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or PMDD. PMDD is actually a technical term used by the APA, or American Psychological Association, that is more severe than PMS and is characterized by severe changes in mood and impaired functioning at work, school, or in social relationships. Both PMS and PMDD may be related to an abnormal response to hormones, such as estrogen or progesterone, or to imbalances in neurotransmitters such as serotonin or GABA. So what is the best way to handle menstrual discomfort? There are a number of ways to handle the discomfort associated with the menstrual and premenstrual period. Don't blame yourself. Menstrual problems are due to hormonal or chemical fluctuations in the brain. If your husband or boyfriend suggests that it is all in your mind, point out his misinformation in a loving and gentle way. Develop strategies for dealing with days that you experience the greatest distress. Develop nutritional eating habits, including eating smaller meals and taking vitamin supplements. Research also suggests that avoiding alcohol, caffeine, fats, salt, and sweets may actually help. But premenstrual women may not like it very much if you take away alcohol, caffeine, fats, salt, and sweets. Regular exercise also helps to relieve premenstrual and menstrual discomfort. So take care of yourself during that time period.